Hey everybody, what's up? I want to welcome you to this uh, review, uh, basically just talking about and reviewing uh, the Boom Studio release of the Chip and Revival release, Boom Studio Comics Revival release of Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. Um, in case some of you don't know, and I, I mentioned this in a previous video over a year ago, uh, and I'll provide a link to that video here. It's an audio video anyway. But basically what I mentioned, basically I, I talked overall about, about the series and how I felt that the writer, I think his name's in here somewhere, Ian Brill, uh, Ian Brill, um, basically, you know, paid attention to what the fan base wanted. I mean, obviously, as we can probably tell, because he has it in a letter here, in the back after the story's done, that he was a fan of the series himself. As a matter of fact, let me uh, read off a little bit of what he said, and I quote uh, Ian Brill, this is July last year in Los Angeles, he says, and I quote, What do you do when you're writing a book with five strong competing personalities? Write five more, of course. Writing Chippendale Rescue Rangers isn't just rewarding, it's also surprising. I create situations that the entire team must deal with and hope that all of the characters will get equal time in these stories. I want everyone's heroism and humor to be recognized. That was part of the thinking behind introducing a group of villains whose membership lined up evenly with all Pineside starring cats. It was a ton of fun thinking of evil versions of each rescue ranger. A silent underground beetle named Digger is there to compete with Zipper, who's always flying high. Orgo is a Colombian turtle, and like Monterey Jack, is the heavy of the team. Also, I loved the look of these animals. If Chip and Dale are true blue detectives, then Scratch and Sniff are carn men and are about the least trustworthy critters on the planet. Then there's Glitch, who I made sure would not just look and act like a twisted version of Gadget. Quote there, would not look and act like a twisted version of Gadget. I also envisioned a connection to Gadget that would inform the events of this entire storyline. Combine it all, all with Leon's, Castellan's brilliant character designs, and I felt we had some new villains worthy of our heroes. So, any, so basically what he's saying is that um, the Glitch character is not, and if you've read these stories already, you know what I mean, these issues already, uh, and if not, I recommend you do. Uh, the Glitch character is not totally evil. She's just misunderstood. She's not, well, not, not misunderstood. She's just, you know, not sure of herself. You know, she wants friendship. And she wants somebody that she's known from her past to befriend her and help her. So, anyway, continuing on with Ian, what Ian Burrell said here. Even with the idea, soon certain characters came to the fore simply by virtue of having unique, dramatic reactions to the challenges the Danger Rangers, Danger Rangers created. If slipping through the cracks was meant to focus on any one character, it was Gadget. Oh, it was to be Gadget. After all, the connection between her and Glitch with its tragic origins is the big emotional linchpin for the end of the story. That still occurs, but over the course of 88 pages, that's all the issues, another character started to emerge with his very own pathos field journey. Dale was, always, Dale, Dale was always a favorite of mine. I even remember preferring Dale when they came out with the ice cream fudge bars in the shape of Chip and Dale's heads. I'm not the only one who remembers those, right? As the story unfolded, I found out I could get a lot of use out of playing Dale's happy-go-lucky personality against the dark vision of the Danger Ranger scheme. 
If the tribulations like risk, if the tribulations the rescue rangers face in the story are required to usually bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, could this really be an adventure that delivers a mighty, even final blow to our heroes? Plus, we had Dale face a real tragedy in issue two. You all love that last trade. Well, you all have that last trade, Worldwide Rescue, yes? Well, I have all the issues. <laughs> and now we had a chance to follow up on Dale's interactions with the father of his sometimes girlfriend. There it is right there. Sometimes girlfriends are acknowledging it, that, not acknowledging that she is Foxglove. All told, all told, old, excuse me. I'm going to zip there. Um, all told, this has Dale truly faced the anxieties pl plaguing him. Within the major story arc, I found a personal story for a character I have a lot of affection for, whose role as the jokester is an important, is an important and vital one. From there, we have more moments where characters' emotions lead the way. Dale's problems bounce off a chip, showing the cost of leadership of this teams of this team of strong personalities. Monty and Gadget's kidnapping needed us to lead. Yeah. Monty and Gadget's kidnapping lead us to revealing both regret and rambunctiousness in Monty, a character who emotes the most on, who emotes the most on the team. Of course, I will never tire of writing Zipper's headstrong antics. The trick to him is to write him as if he's the star of his own action blockbuster, which I feel he certainly thinks he is. I have these observations about the characters characters in my head but notions of what to do with them seems to always occur in the moment usually happening during the scripting stage it's almost the purest type of creative discovery because it's my instinctual storytelling skills my gut reaction leading the way these characters emotional responses don't come from a logical anatomical part of the minds. minds. Therefore, my depiction of such emotion must come from a deep part of my own storytelling self. Then I must transport those ideas to the world of logic, storyline, storytelling logic, and figure out how to communicate such ideas to the reader as you are the whole reason us storytellers do this crazy job. That and I got to write ninjas. Ninjas are cool. And that's quoted off Ian Burrell, and I'll post a, a link to the picture of the writing so you can see it yourself. Uh, but overall, I have to say that all the stories connected, I thought were done very, very well. I mean, I mean, you can't go wrong with, with what you have here. I mean, the character, you know, connection, the, like you said, the, uh, you know, the kind of like, the anti-ness, if you will, kind of like the opposite kind of situation. And Glitch, you know, when you when you read her, when you read about her towards the end, you think she's just wanting to, you know, she's just a villain, but then you find out that she's had a past with Gadget. Basically, the fact that she envies Gadget and looks, kind of looks up to her because she could do things and invent things in a blink of an eye. And she, all Glitch wants is to do the same thing, but she can't. So, Glitch basically overall wants Gadget to be like a friend to her and be like a mentor. Now Gadget's willing to give that to her, but then Glitch kind of runs off. Which leaves us open with a cliffhanger of what could have been still and what could still be. But overall, with these... Final, uh, final eight issues gathered together here, and along with the other first four that I have. Uh, I have to say, Ian Burrell and, and the people that worked with him did a great job, paid great attention to detail when it came to the characters. Um, so, I, to the characters and, you know, to what fans wanted to see. I mean, I mean, I mean it's like I said in my audio vi video I did over a year ago. Ian Brill obviously have had to pay attention to the 
to the fan base. And because, like I said, he was a fan himself, so he knew exactly what the fans wanted. So don't tell me he didn't go online before doing this and looked up what fans would like to see or even talk to fans and from a fan standpoint and realize, you know what? I bet fans would like to see Fox Club again and ha see her have more interaction and more to do, you know, with, you know, with the Rescue Rangers and more of her interaction and, as we find out, roman romance or relationship that she has with Dale. And I thought that was pretty good that he allowed that to happen. I also like the fact that he took a page out of Chris Fisher's book when he put Tammy as a nurse. I mean, this is, again, I said this in the audio, this is one of the characters along Fox that fans wanted to see more of. And I'm sure he looked at it and said, you know what, fans will, fans will always left. we, you know, and he probably looked at it, and the way he looked at it by inserting these two, he said, you know what, fans were always left with a cliffhanger after those one-shot episodes with them, wondering if they would ever come back, wondering if they would be part of the team or have some kind of association and capacity. And he gives that to us in these eight issues, especially um, especially this, this last issue. I mean, think about it. Would you ever expect to see her again? I mean, and I, and I like the fact that they even dedicate one cover. They do a co cover gallery behind here. Well, you have Fox Club on, I think, the cover of, I'm trying to think, issue seven, right there. That's pretty damn cool. And again, it's good to see that they take inspiration not just from the original source material, keeping it close to what we used to see on television, but also give the, but also take inspiration from what the fans would have liked to see, from what the fans could come up with. I really thought that was a great move on their part, because when you think about it, it's like he said in that thing, it's all about the fans. And being a fan himself, he realized that fans wanted to see more Fox Club. They wanted to see more Tammy. They wanted to see more, uh, more adventures with the Rangers. They wanted to see more about, they probably wanted to see more about Gadget's past. They wanted to see Dale develop more and mature more, like he did in the series, but even more so. They wanted to see, obviously, you know, opposite equals to them, but who are on the other side of the law. They wanted to see some personal, basically what they wanted to see was more grown-up, like, uh, subjects in this, uh, in this comic, or in these stories. That's what they wanted to see. And him being a fan, like I say, a fan himself, he obviously knew that's what fans wanted. And I apologize for that noise back there. That was the bird, or the family's bird. But again, he obviously knew what fans wanted with this story. He knew what we wanted. And to know what we wanted, at being a fan himself, to me, gave him an advantage. No doubt about it. I mean, again, to say, hey, what would it be like if they faced alternate versions of themselves? In other words, opposite versions of themselves. People with the same, uh, the same uh, equalness, almost in every way can match him, you know, in every way, but be on the other side of the law. He did great when he did these characters right here. He did great. And Glitch, I like how it leaves you on the cliffhanger about her. It makes you wonder, will she turn good? Because as soon as Gadget apologizes for not helping her with a project, because obviously it does trigger something in Gadget's mind, it's like it changes Glitch. It's like Glitch is going like, do I really want to do this? This girl just apologized for not helping me. This girl sounds like she wants to be my friend. You know, so to me, I like, I like how that was shown and developed. And it leaves you on a cliffhanger begging for more. But the question is, will there be more? I hope to God there is. But again, what he did was he basically said, you know what? You know, fans want more. Let's give them more. And the way they wrote these stories, and I think I said this in the audio video, they wrote them to where it's not just for kids, but for fans that grew up on the series. I mean, think about this. Think about this. This came out 21 years after the series debuted. So basically, a little over 20 years after. So it's not just for, like I said, the younger kids that probably recently discovered the Rangers on Toon Disney and through DVD and, and all that. 
but it's also for the fans who grew up with them for the past 20 years. The, for the fans over at the Acorn Cafe, at the Fox Club feature, at the Chippendale online sites and places like that, the, at Toon Zone, that grew up with these characters and these shows, knowing that you, if you're going to give them stories, new stories, re, if you're going to revive them just maybe for eight issues and give them new stories, you need to give them stories that are not just for kids, that kids can understand, but are good and, but are good enough and complex enough and attention grabbing enough for the adults that grew up with them as grew up with the show and characters when they were kids. So to me, he, he did a great job here and there's nothing more you could say about it. And I definitely have to say, the way the story was wrote, all these issues, he took inspiration from Chris Fisher and all the other top writers out there, fan fiction writers out there, when he did this. So I have to give him credit there. He took inspiration and ran with it. He was given the ball, he ran, and to my opinion, he scored multiple times, hit grand slams, slam, hit grand slams, home runs, sl hit slam dunks, you know, hit the, you know, got the final goal every time in a hot, you know, he just, he just, to me, achieved, overachieved what he wanted, and that's a great thing. Sometimes you can achieve it, but if you overachieve it, that's even better. Um, but yeah, he definitely gave us everything. I mean, this is basically to quote Doug Walker, because Doug Walker, during his Decem Disney December series, said at the end of the Roger Rabbit review that that was a love letter to our childhood. This is Ian Brill's love letter to the fellow Rescue Ranger fans that supported these characters for the past 20, over 22 years now, or 23 years now, but more so at, this, at the time this was released, 20 plus years. So that, this was basically this along with the first four were a love letter to the fans because of everything that was put into it. You know, it was the reappearance of Fox Club and her more active role, Tammy, you know, looking deeper, in, diving deeper, deeper into Gadget's past and asked and everything. It was just tremendous. And I hope to God, I pray to God, they bring out more. When, let's say, Disney's supposed to be back with Marvel now. Hopefully Marvel take brings someone like Ian Brill in and says, you know what, let's have him work on this again. Because I would like to see a lot more. And I know a lot of people watching this video would agree. So I give... Like I said in the, like I said in my audio review, I'm pretty sure I said this. I give this entire eight issues, ten stars, a hundred stars, five stars. You know, definitely worth reading. And if they could make episodes out of these, you know, like let's say new, one time only episodes, maybe even directed DVD Blu-ray episodes of Rescue Rangers. If they could do that, those DVDs and Blu-rays would sell out. No time flat, I guarantee it. So, but that to me is an overall on-screen review and shoot, if you will, on how good this is. From a fan's perspective. A fan that grew up with the series since 1989, maybe late 88, depending on what information you get. But grew up on it for the past 23 to 24 years. So, Comment down below, respond if you like. I would like to hear from you guys. What do you think? Do you agree with what I said? Please respond. I would appreciate it. Zero Nizarek, MJ Knight, anybody, let me know. And that's all I'm going to say for now. James Sullivan, if you want to, Jamie Tude, uh, Patrick Butler, anybody, let me know what you guys think. Respond and comment if you like. And I will talk to you all later. God bless. Take care.